mic that works. Hi. Welcome, everyone, to our 48th Sunday Assembly San Diego. We have, my name is Alexis Rucker, and Stephen is sick today. We were going to co MC, but that didn't work out. So um, let me go through all the Sandy, Sunday Assemblies in the world in alphabetical order. Albuquerque, San Diego, Yay. London, and um, Alcatraz, is that a place? Yeah, um, and a bunch more, all right, see, this one's great. Um, if you are, if it's your first time to Sunday Assembly, please raise your hand or nod or look at your feet, all embarrassed, there we go, and give, look at everybody that's new and give them a high five. We have a media-free zone, which is on this side of the room, and uh, you won't be on camera. We take pictures and avoid you, and uh, you can slink in, slink out, never make eye contact. My first ever Sunday assembly, I snuck in, sat in the very back with my cousin, and uh, in the media-free zone. See, it works out. <laughs> we'll never call on you for anything. All right, and then to start us off, we're going to shake it with Paul. We are going to shake it with Paul. I brought my drummer today. Good morning, everybody. I was going to bring a blonde wig for this song. Slide. Get up. Turn it up. More, more, more. I stay away too late Got nothing on my brain That's what people say That's what people say I go on too many dates But I can't even say That's what people say That's what people say But I keep cruising Can't stop What's the name of the song? What's the first word of the name of the song? And does that mean stand still with your feet on the ground? No, it does not. So let's try to go back one. Let's hit, let's hit the chorus again. Here we go. Cause the player's gonna play, 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 play. And the haters gonna hate, hate, hate. I'm a gonna shake, 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 shake. Shake it off, shake it off. Heartbreaker's gonna break, 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 break. And the baby's gonna fake, 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 fake. Baby, I'm a gonna shake, 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 shake. Shake it off, shake it off. I never miss a beat. I'm lightning on my feet. That's what they don't see. That's what they don't see. I'm dancing on my own. What they don't know, that's what they don't know. But I keep cruising, can't stop, won't stop moving. Like I've got this music in my say and it's gonna be all. Here we go! Cause the player's gonna play, play, play. and the gonna hate me. Baby, I'm gonna shake, 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 shake. Shake it off, shake it off. Oh, heartbreaker's gonna break, break, break. And baker's gonna fake, 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 fake. I'm gonna shake, 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 shake. it off, shake it off. I shake it off, shake it off. Come on now. Shake it off, shake it off. Shake it off, shake it off. 
Cause the players gonna play, play, play And the haters gonna hate, hate Baby, I'm just gonna shake, 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 shake Shake it off, shake it off Our break is gonna break, break, break And the players gonna fake, 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 fake I'm gonna shake, shake, shake Shake it off, shake it off Shake it off, shake it off Shake it off, shake it off, shake it off. Come on! Shaken. You may sit. Now, if your kids have some idea that the rest of the assembly is going to be like that, maybe uh, break those expectations and send them to our complimentary child care run by professionals. There's a window where you can see them, but you can't hear them, um, which I find one of the best things about assembly, <laughs> as a mother of two. Um, we also are starting something, a couple new things. Uh, one new thing is our youth group, and I'm doing that thing you told me not to do, and standing right in front of the, here we go. Okay. Here we go. Um, we have a youth group starting up, which is for kids that are a little too old to be in childcare, but they wanna do something, they're maybe 10, 11 or up, or if they feel like it, um, for teens and preteens. It's led by Candelario, and we're looking for a female lead to help him out for balance and for his wife's replacement, because she's gonna do it this time, but she doesn't wanna do it every time. Um, so if you are interested in volunteering for that, or um, know of someone you can bully into volunteering for that, we would appreciate it. But this is also going to be facilitated by adults, but led by Kid, Kid Cedric. Um, the other thing we're going to do that's new is we have some feedback cards on the table. So you can grab one of those and let us know what you'd like to see, um, what you'd like to, us to do, if you have any uh, outreach events that you're interested in, we would like to know those. Another thing we do at Sunday Assembly is Life Happens, where you fill out your cards in the front and let us know kind of what's happening in your life. We've got two this morning. One is from Connor who um, is a youth mentor with Access Youth Academy, and he says, a bunch of my students just got accepted to UCSD and UCLA. <laughs> and remind me, wherever Connor went, remind me, these are kids that this is their first, like they're the first in their family to go to college? Yes. <laughs> so that's a big deal. Um, and Amber Jones says, my darling daughter, Kaylee Bug, Kaylee Bug and Pizza? Pizza, thank you. I'm like, pizza, nice. <laughs> Turned 17 on the 21st. Happy birthday, Kaylee Bug. <laughs> Love, Mom and Peter. And then we also have a segment because our motto is live better, help often, and wonder more. And uh, we try to do things along those lines, live better, wonder more with our speakers, and help often. Um, and one of our new help often events is coming up soon, Jim. Good morning. So on March 25th, we'll be having our first beach cleanup of the year at our adopted beach at South Shores. That's on Mission Bay, right next to SeaWorld. Um, over our past cleanups, we've cleaned up more than 300 pounds of trash, more than 150 pounds of recycling, including more than 1,500 cigarette butts, just at our little beach. Um, all supplies will be provided if you can bring reusable water bottle, gloves, a bucket. That's great, that helps them, uh, reduce the environmental impact of our cleanup. Um, if you have any questions, see me after the assembly. All the details are on the meetup and you can RSVP there. I hope you'll join us. For our reading today, we have Lewis doing, I heard him practicing, that sounds really good. 
This is Of Roots and Roamers by Ada Lamone. Have you noticed how the trees change from state to state? Not all at once, of course. More like a weaver gradually weaving in another color until the old trees become scarce and new trees offer a shaded kingdom all their own. Before I knew the names of towns or roads, I could recognize places by the trees, Northern California's smooth-skinned madrone, looming eucalyptus, fuzzy fragrant flowers of the acacia. So much of America belongs to the trees. Even when we can't agree on much, there's still a man returning from his late shift at the local bar who takes a long look at the bird's nest in the maple, pats the trunk like a friend's forearm, mumbles something about staying safe, and returns home. And the girl whose slapdash tree fort we can see from our blurry window, how she stands there to wave at a world she does not even know the half of yet. My grandmother once complained that she couldn't see much of America on her cross-country trip because it was all just trees. <laughs> Ask her, she'll laugh as she tells you. Still, without the bother of licenses or attention to a state line, a border, they just grow where they've grown all their lives. There, a small stand of white pine <coughs> arrives. There, a redwood begins to show itself along the coastline. Water oaks in the south, willows. Their power is not in moving, so we must move to them. Point to each new tree to find out where we have come from and where we are going. now one of my favorite goodness hello speaker my nemesis um i'd like to introduce the man that makes speaking in the third person really difficult alexis dixon he is an expert in conflict resolution and he has been on the board of the national conflict resolution center he was a facilitator for the san diego race human relations commission and he doesn't know it yet but he's volunteered to drive between my kids in the back seat on the drive home from assembly Mr. Alexis Dixon. Hi. And it doesn't sound like she's joking, you know, that's the, uh, it doesn't sound like it. Um, good morning. Um, I just, a, a, a few quick observations. One is, I'm black, just want to throw that out very quickly. Uh, for those of you who don't see color. Just let you know. I don't see gender, so, you know, <laughs> so maybe in good company. Um, the second thing is I noticed that after, um, I'm English also, I'm British, uh, don't hold that against me either. Uh, we still love you guys. Um, and then the next thing is, um, I noticed that after me next Sunday, you've got a cannabis person coming. So I don't know the conflict thing, the cannabis thing, I don't know how you're sequencing that, but, um, I just know that apparently after I speak, you're going to need to chill out. So, you know, hope, hope it's good stuff. Call me, let me know. Um, that's it. Um, so my, um, I'm, I'm British. I'm British. I lived here for a long time. I uh, was born in Guyana. I'm Guyanese, uh, raised in England. Uh, played professional soccer in Madrid and Italy most of my life and traveled throughout Europe most of my life. Um, my mom, my grandfather is Scottish a tall, white, bald guy who talked to just like this. And thank you, grandfather. He gave me his uh, you know, lack of dreadlocks. And um, my mother is black and Indian. So I come from a kind of a racially diverse family and um, lived in Europe most of my life. And so when I came here, my father was a politician um, in Grenada in the West Indies. So I'm born in Guyana. Both my parents are from Grenada. For those of you who are beyond 35, you probably know about the American invasion of Grenada. Um, um, so that was the little island that both my parents are from. And so, um, um, so I lived most of my life in, in Europe, went to school there. And then my father, who was a politician, had to come, after the invasion of Grenada, had to come to San Diego. And so at the time, I was living in Italy. So when we talk about conflict, I want you to kind of understand cultural dissonance a little bit. Black guy, British accent, living in Italy, comes to Pacific Beach. Hold that thought. A lot of questions about who I am and what I am and where I am. 
Um, anyway, um, my background is psychotherapy and conflict resolution. I spent a year at Harvard University studying conflict resolution, went to Grenada, did some work there with Save the Children International and travel all over the world doing a lot of work around conflict. And then um, eventually ended up um, here, where at the time, so now I'm doing corporate conflict, going into corporations and looking at how conflict defines culture. When you look at corporations, when you look at families, my kids, you know, right? Like, how does the conflict define my relationship with my children, you know? How does the conflict define my relationship with my wife or my husband? Because at the end of the day, conflict ain't going nowhere. It's here to stay. So when we talk about peace, what we're really talking about is the management of conflict. How do we manage it? Um, <clears throat> and so that's, that's, uh, that's what I'm working with in, in, in corporations. I'm looking at how we do that. Um, two things I want to talk about in terms of language. One is we always say you can either be right or you can be happy. And I don't want to shift that. Huh? I've heard it before. You've heard that before. <laughs> Yeah, if there's a husband who slept on the sofa, you knew being right, uh, at midnight doesn't feel good because your sofa ain't that comfortable, right? Right, so oh my God, I'm right, but here I am on the sofa, right? I'm alienated, being right. Um, being right in respect to conflict is an egoic construction. The ego has an addiction, and one of the strongest addiction of the ego is the desire to be right. The desire to be right. Think of the times when you were right, how it empowered you. What did you say? Think of the times you were right. You know I'm right. You do know I'm right, right? I mean, you do know that. Did you, you know, you know I'm, I'm educated. I'm not making this up. I am right. You fool, you idiot, you go with me. Think of the times you were right. What did it embolden you to do? How did you behave? Were you kind? Were you nice? Were you attentive? Were you tender? Were you empathic? Because we say you can either be right or be happy and I want to introduce you to a new construction. You can either be right egoically or you can be empathic. Happiness is fleeting. So you can either be right or you can be empathic. Very different intersections into the world. When I'm right, I defend. I have to take a stand and I have to defend it. You become the other. Because I'm right and I have to defend being right. And I'm right based on my version of being right, not on your version of being right. And when I'm right, I've got to win the argument. I've got to win because I'm right, I'm strong, I'm mighty. You see that in leadership. I'm right. There's no questioning. There is me, there's you, and I'm going to win, and I'm going to defend. That's an egoic construction. In the egoic construction of being right, I am my thought. I don't have a thought. I am my thought. So when I have a belief, and you disagree with my belief, you're fundamentally disagreeing with me. You're threatening me. Think of the times you were right, with your kids, with your loved ones, with your employees, driving down the road and someone cut in front of you. Remember how kind you were? <laughs> you say, oh my God, come to my birthday party. <laughs> Remember that? You said that? And you said, and the little kids in the back say, mom, don't say that. That's adult stuff. That's how adults speak. You can't say that. Right. So the need to be right is, a, is, a, is an addiction of the ego. The egoic construction says, in order for me to be alive, in order for me to be validated, I have to be right. And in order for me to be right, I need somebody to be on the other side. I need to, I need to win this engagement. It's about me winning at all cost. So in corporate culture, the need to be right would lead me to not share information, right? Go into the boardroom and do something to my, to my, what do you call it, obstruct, deny, blame. Think of the, think of the company you work, in, you work in or have worked in and the conflict, where does the conflict come from? Blaming, denying, not sharing information, withholding, shaming, 
right? These are all egoic constructions. I have to win and I have to win at all cost. On the level of countries, the diaper heads, the evil doers, we are good and they're bad. There's another. I'm not them. In war, we're not allowed to call the enemies by their names. They're the gooks. They're the, for those of you who are veterans of war, you know that. You cannot humanize the other side. There's a story about the war. Was it between the Americans and the Germans? The Christmas Day, Do you, have you guys seen that film? Where they got together, they called the truce, the Christmas truce, and the two fighting sides that were killing each other came out. They started talking to each other, smoked cigarettes. I think they played baseball or soccer, showed photographs of each other's children, went back into the trenches, could not kill each other. Humanizing, they humanized each other. In ego, I don't humanize. I make you an object, I make you a thing, I make you an enemy, I make you the other, you're not me. There is no empathy in the egoic construction. The sympathy, definitely not empathy. The ego is addicted to wanting. It's addicted to being right. And in order for me to be right, you have to be wrong. I lived downtown with my girl for about 10 years, and we're walking to the movies, and a student from San Diego State and his girlfriend, it appeared, were walking past us. And she's walking in front of him, but probably 21, 22, and she's walking in front of him, and she's got a frown on her face, and he's walking behind her, and he says to her, if only you would do what I ask you to do, everything would be just perfect between us. <laughs> if only you would see things my way, everything would be just fine. And my girl goes, babe, babe, go say something to him. I'm like, I don't know him. <laughs> she goes, but babe, you do conflict resolution. Go tell him. Go I'm like, no, we, we're going to dinner. She babe, just say something. So I'm running behind this guy. He's sending a state. <laughs> and I'm saying, you know, when you say that to your girl, you can either be right or you can be empathic. When, you know, this is your egoic construction. You're going to other your girl. You're going to sleep on. And this kid is looking at me like, who the hell are you? Like, why are you saying this to me? I, I don't know you, you know? And it's just like, so you get into these things. But um, on a very, on a very, Subtle level, the ego is always there. And the ego is not our friend. The ego wants what it wants, when it wants it, how it wants it, and it wants it in its way and does not care about you. So you're not your ego. So what is the ego rooted in? The ego is rooted in fear. It's always afraid of losing. I'm afraid of losing my dignity. I'm afraid of losing my place in society. I'm, a place, I'm afraid of losing love. I'm afraid of not being liked. I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. And there's never enough to satisfy the ego. It's never satisfied, because it's always fear-based. It can always lose. So how does the ego engage the world? It's fearful, and then it engages the world. Hold a space for that. I'm fearful, and then I engage the world. So what does that mean if I'm fearful and then I engage the world? What is the quality of my listening to you if I'm fearful? I'm fearful, and then I listen to you. I listen to defend, because I'm fearful. I listen to defend. You want an example of that? Woman's right to choose, the immigration issue. You're the other. I listen to you not to understand you, but to defend against you. In my politics, in my love relationship with you, I listen to defend, I listen to you're the other. I have to protect my right to exist. I have to defend this love. When I'm fear-based, I don't include you. I cannot be fearful and empathic at the same time. I'm either happy or I'm empathic. I'm either happy or I'm empathic. I cannot be both at the same time. Um, can you put the slide up very quickly? 
disguised as Zim Kamisa. So I just talked a little bit about listening to defend through the egoic construction. So what causes conflict? See life through the ego, which is fear-based, listening to defend. Let's talk about it in a more harsher terms. I had the pleasure of knowing Azim Kamisa and Plez. Azim Kamisa was home, he's an international banker, and um, his son was a student at San Diego State University, 19 years old. Azim was home, got a phone call, someone had called the pizza uh, place where his son worked, ordered a pizza, and when his son got there, there were two gang members a 14-year-old boy and a 19-year-old boy. Azim's son gets there with the pizza. 14, the 19-year-old boy tells the 14-year-old boy to kill the pizza delivery boy. I'm gonna condense this for time. I'm either happy, I'm either right, or I'm empathic. This is listening to understand versus listening to defend. This is going through life with empathy and then engaging in life listening to understand. Azim is home, he gets a phone call that his son was murdered. A 19-year-old boy told a 14-year-old boy who didn't know the pizza delivery boy to murder the pizza delivery boy. The 14-year-old boy told this story. Azim said he was home, got the news, and of course he's devastated, it's his only son. Goes down, sees the fact that his son is murdered, and then wants to meet the murderer of his son. So as he goes down, he wants to meet this boy who murdered, and he said this kid turns the corner and he doesn't see a murderer, he sees a little boy, he sees a child. And he wants to know what happened with this child. Of course, he's angry, he's hurt, it's a loss, it's a devastating loss. So, but he wants to know this, what happened? What, what's going on with this boy? Why did this boy murder my son? So he called up to speak to the grandfather, the grandfather doesn't want to meet him. Finally, the grandfather agrees to meet him, and he says, what happened here? And the grandfather felt complicit in the murder of his son because he had taught the boy. Grandfather was a veteran, taught his grandson how to shoot and so felt that, you know, but this was a kid who was raised without parents. The grandfather raised him. So Azim said, I have to ask a question. When I listen to defend, I give answers. I tell you what to do. When I listen to, under when I listen to understand through empathy, I ask a question. So if Azim had done this through his ego, he would have said, the world is a terrible place. Cause and effect, cause and effect. The world is a terrible place. It took my son from me. How awful the world is. What a bad place the world is. Look what the world has done to me. I am the victim of the world. The world is making me hate young black boys. The world is making me bitter and jaundiced. I didn't deserve this. I'm a good person. Narrative of the ego cause and effect. In empathy, listening to understand, I am the cause and I am the effect. And I asked the question. In the midst of the murder of his son, unjustifiable, he asked the question. Listen to the construction of the question. How is it that we live in a world where young boys grow up to kill other young boys? How is it that we create a world where young boys grew up to kill other young boys. And so through that question, he went to the grandfather of the boy who killed his son and said, I've got an idea. Let's you and I start an organization, the Tariq Kamisa Foundation, and get young boys to not kill each other. You'll stand on stage, you're the grandfather of the boy who murdered my son. I am the boy, I'm the father of the boy who was murdered, and we'll go and talk to kids and tell them not to do this because of the pain that you have felt and the pain that I have felt. And so two men who met through murder created an alliance and have gone through schools over the last 20 years and have spoken to children, both in San Diego and Los Angeles, and have saved hundreds of lives. Kids at Yale, Harvard, UCSD have come back to the Camisa Foundation and said, I was gonna kill myself, until you stopped me, I was, I was bullied, I was gonna bully, I was gonna come to school and kill other children, and because of you, I have shifted. He said they were flying once and they wanted a plane, he and Plez, and they were having a good time. And the flight attendant said, how do you guys know each other? And he said, oh, his grandson murdered my son and we became <laughs> friends. Hold a space, hold a space, hold that space. Listen to the, listen, hold the space. His grandson killed my son, and we became friends. Empathy, you can either be right, 
or you can be empathic. I am the cause and I am the effect. But your son was murdered, yes, but I'm the cause and I'm the effect. I still choose to engage in society. But your son was murdered, I know, but I choose to still give back to the world. But aren't you better? I am, but I still choose to give back to the world. It's not Pollyanna. Listening to understand is not Pollyanna. It's not ignoring, it's not denying. Denial means choose to know. You're not choosing not to know. You're seeing everything clearly. You're just simply the cause, and you're simply the effect. But don't you hate the world? I don't hate the world. I see the world as dangerous, but I still choose to love the world. 20 years later, Azim had a fundraising event for his foundation, and he invited me to come. I was honored to come. He said, I've got great news. I want you to be here. Sit at the table. I'm going to share something with, with everybody. And he goes up in front of 500 people with Plez, calls him his spiritual brother. And he says, I'm going to thank all 500 of you for being here. Um, the Tariq Kamisa Foundation has been going on for 20 years. Tony, who was 14 years old that murdered his son, is about to get out. Azim has gone to visit him, written books about him. He's written the, pre the preface for Azim's book. Azim has gotten him to go to college, finish college. This is the kid that murdered his son, by the way spent time with him. And Azim said a year and a half ago, I've got great news. Plus, my spiritual brother come up. Plus stands next to him. And he goes, Plus and I are spiritual brothers. I love him. We've got great news tonight. Tony, the kid who murdered my son, is about to be released from prison. And I've got great news. I've asked Tony to work with the foundation. And so I want you to look at this. Imagine this. Plez, who's the grandfather of the boy who murdered my son. Tony, the boy who murdered my son. And me, the father of the boy who were murdered, going to stand on stage and imagine the lives we're going to change. And this is exactly how the audience respond. <laughs> Should we clap for that? We can either be right or we can be empathic. When I'm right, I want to win. I want to win. When I'm empathic, I want to gain, I want to understand, I want to engage. I hold my humanity and I hold your humanity. I asked Azim once, I said, how do you forgive Tony? He said, it took some time. How did you forgive Tony? It took some time. So what does it mean? What does that mean? He says, every night I go home and I weep for my son. Listen to the language. Every night I go home, I weep for my son. I'm not gonna see him graduate college, I'm not gonna be a grandfather, I'm not gonna be there for his wedding. I miss him. I also cry for Tony. I also weep for the boy who murdered my son because he's gone as well. When I listen to understand, when I'm empathic, I am the cause and I'm the effect. Heavy, heavy lifting. Could you love a kid who murdered your son? Don't answer that. Somebody said no. <laughs> Could you love a kid who murdered your son? Empathy. Empathy in real time. Can you love someone who cussed you out? Can you still hold a space for them? Can you love somebody who doesn't agree with you politically? It's a tough time politically. Or do we get into an egoic construction where they're the other? Don't agree with them at all. The difference between what makes listening to understand massively difficult is agree. The person may not forgive you. The person may not accept your forgiveness. You may not agree with the person. Can I love someone that I don't agree with? In listening to defend, you have to agree with me. You have to validate my, ex you know what I mean, right? You know, speak to the hand, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, we're not, shh. hey, you know what I'm saying? Speak to the hand. Immigration issue, I'm down with that. Oh, you're not? Oh, okay, are you Native American? Then shut the hell up, okay? Immigration is for everybody. Unless you're a Native American, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. And if you don't agree with me, speak to the hand. You ever done any one of these? Don't make me say it again, I've told you twice. 
right? So we have language, but, but this means you are the other. I am separate from you. And until we agree, there is no connection. This is conditional. Listening to defend is conditional. I like you if, I like you when, I like you how. Very conditional. This is I simply love you. We're gonna disagree, yeah. We're gonna have fights, yeah, but I love you. I hold you, I price you. In the egoic construction, I am fearful, and then I go into my relationship with you. In my egoic construction, I am fearful, and then I go into relationship with you. In my empathy, I love you, and I go into my relationship with you. But Tony murdered your son. I know, don't you hate him? I don't like what he did. But he's part of me. It's part of my life. He's in the world with me. But you will never see Tariq again. Yeah, I know. But think of the lives we're gonna save, Tony and I. Heavy, heavy, heavy lifting. Heavy lifting. Does this solve all the problems in the world? No, it doesn't. But it gives us a different way to engage conflict. Conflict is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. With this demand of us, particularly at this time, is that we bring an empathy, an empathic engagement into everything we do. I went to a talk the other day at the university and it was on civility and they had closed the doors and all these brilliant people were speaking on civility. I'm thinking, well, if we were to... <laughs> and I'm thinking if we were to lock the doors and we were to create the world right now, what world would we create? Are we more empathic than anybody else? Are we more empathic than the people out there? The next time someone cuts you off, call me and let me know how empathic you are. <laughs> how deeply you were listening to understand. So you can either be right or you can be empathic. Empathy is difficult because the world is, will not please you. The world will break your heart. The world is a heartbreaker. Can our hearts be open and still love? Can our hearts be broken and we can still love? I'm sure the other one. So this is Zeman Plaz, they've been together. This woman is an Israeli woman. Her name is, ah, um, oh, I just, oh, not Jerry. I'll tell you her name in a moment, I'm blanking on it. Um, but she's a lovely lady. Um, her son was murdered, she's uh, Israeli. And her son was a school teacher who did two years in the military. And I think two weeks before um, he was done with his military duty, he was shot. He was shot by a Palestinian boy. And uh, he was a school teacher, he was very much a pacifist. And when they found the boy who, the Palestinian boy who murdered him, um, she asked the Israeli government to not do anything to him. And in fact, she wanted to go and actually meet the mother of the boy who had murdered her son. True story, she was just, this was taken at USD. And uh, she wanted to meet the mother and the mother didn't want to meet with her. And she continued and continued listening to understand. And she said, please, I'd like to meet you. And finally she met the mother, and the mother told her the story that her son, her Palestinian son, was murdered by an Israeli <laughs> soldier. So here we have two mothers who were grieving. And so they created, listening to understand, created an organization for Palestinian mothers and Israeli mothers to talk about the impact of losing children in the war, and now they're changing lives. Listening to understand is very difficult, and that's, what need, that's what's needed in our corporate culture. That's what's needed in our political conversations. Can you hold a space for someone who says something that, I don't like your God, I hate your God. I don't like you, I don't like your family. At it's very worse, we're talking about tribalism and genocide. And it's very worse. And it's very worse, we're talking what Christians call hell. Right? Listening to defend in its darkest hour, it's what Christians call hell. It's what Buddhism called being asleep. Listening to understand empathy is what Christians at its highest level, Christians call that God. I am the cause and I'm the fact, I love you. But I'm a sinner, yes, but I love you. But I fall short, yes, but I love you. I see it, don't deny it, but I still love you. 
I love you and then I engage with you. I've got a last story I'll tell you. I've got an African-American friend who actually got me into mediation. Her name is um, Brenda. And Brenda is an African-American engineer, studied conflict resolution for a number of years. And um, about 10, 15 years ago, at the cross on Soledad, there was a guy from, I think, El Cajon Metzner? 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 He's an Aryan racist kind of guy. So we're having coffee, and Brenda goes, I'm going to go meet him. I'm like, you're black. <laughs> <laughs> And you ain't light-skinned black, you real black. He's gonna see you coming. She goes, yeah, but I wanna meet him. I'm like, uh, what else, you, you, know, you have nothing on your schedule? I mean, this guy has publicly said he don't like people who look like you. Uh, I don't think he's gonna change. She goes, no, I just wanna see what he's gonna say. Totally serious, totally serious. So she goes up to Soledad and she goes up to this guy who is a proclaimed racist. And she says, hi, I'm Brenda. He says, hi, I'm, I think his name is John, that's not something like Tom, Tom, yeah. He says, hi, I'm Tom. I heard you don't like black people. Listening to understand. Listening to understand. I heard you don't like black people. I don't. Hate them. Can you tell me more about that? Listening to understand. Can you tell me more about that? America is for white people. The white man made America. Anything good that's happened in this country is because of the white man. Listening to understand. Sounds like you really love your country. I love America. America is the greatest country on the earth. And if it wasn't for white people, this country would go to shit. Sounds like you're a man of history. Listening to understand. Sounds like you're a man of history and that you've really put a lot of thought into this and that you really love your people and you really have this really strong desire to really promote your race. I really do. And if the Mexicans left and the blacks went back to Africa and the Jews went back to Israel and all you darkies leave, imagine how great this country would be. Sounds like you really love America quite a bit. Listening to understand. Don't agree with a damn thing he's saying. <laughs> so what does the world need? How do we manage conflict? We manage conflict through empathy and then engagement. Heavy lifting. Heavy, heavy lifting. But there's no other substitute for love than love. And we don't use this word a lot. Love is a behavior. It's not a feeling. Love is a behavior. It's a form of engagement. Love is a behavior. Think of the people who are pissing you off right now. And if you just listen to them at the highest level, there's nothing to defend. Last story about me, then I'll stop. Um, the other morning, my girl and I are about to go to Japan. We're going to be leaving for Japan on Wednesday. And so my girl gets really nervous. She researches and researches and researches and researches. And re so by the time we get to Japan, we know every corner of Japan. And, <laughs> and so um, the other morning, we have like all these hotels booked and we haven't really. There's one in Tokyo. We've booked everything except Tokyo. So we got up that morning and she goes, hey, babe, let's put on this Tibetan bells, bells music because it's like really soothing and it makes you very peaceful and all that, so we have the bells on and the Tibetan music and I've got my Zen on. And then I started talking about the hotel and we got into the biggest freaking fight. So here's the Tibetan music playing. <laughs> here's the conflict resolution expert <laughs> fighting with his girlfriend <laughs> about a hotel in Tokyo. And in the middle of this, I looked at it and I said, you know, I'm so glad those bells are working so well, you know? We started laughing. The ego is always here waiting for us. In Christianity, we call it free will, right? We call it free will. We can either choose to go into the world and listen to defend and be addicted, attached to our addiction to be right. That's one choice we have, and it's there, and we see it, and it's manifest. We've killed over 100 million of our own people, our own species, simply because we were right and they were wrong. Think of the times when you are right and how you behave, really honestly. I do it, it's not just, I mean, we see it in the world. 
the other choice we have is this that waits for us, this listening to understand, this empathy, this love. Not Pollyanna love, but is the world a bad place? Yes, but I choose to love. Do bad things happen? Yes, it does, but I choose to love. Tony murdered your son. Yes, but I still choose to love Tony. I've got great news. Tony gets out of prison in a couple of years and think of it, on stage will be me, the father whose, was, whose son was murdered. Tony, the boy who murdered my son and his grandfather. Think of the lives we're gonna change. Heavy lifting. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this was helpful. <laughs>
you know, and you see what's happening in Syria. He wants it all for himself, or we see other kinds of leadership. So the world is a lovely place because we are loved, because we come from a lovely place. I'm working with the leader, the last thing I'll say, I promise. I'm working with the leader and executive, and I said, how are things going? And he says, you know, it's interesting, in working with you, nothing has changed except me. I have changed. And so the world is different, and that's what the co I am the cause and the effect is. Okay? Hey, everybody. So we were supposed to cut that breakout session short, but everyone was so engaged, and, and all your thoughts were amazing. So we just ran it right into the song. We'll still sing later. Um, <laughs> but we're going to go straight to the personal moment with Candelario. And if I wasn't super clear before, you can come on up. Um, youth group will break out uh, in the foyer right after the personal moment, and so just follow Candy that way afterwards. OK, hello. All right. I'm nervous right now, so I'm, I'm not a good public speaker, but here's my personal moment. All right. Well, um, this took place in the mid-2000s, early 2000s. I was uh, my early 20s in the Air Force, and uh, I was deployed to South America in a, like a small town. It had like about 200,000 people, so it was kind of a medium-sized town. Um, when I first got there, um, there was a few things that struck me that I noticed. Uh, it was a poor country. Um, it has no running water. No sewage. Um, it's very poor. Um, it was, uh, let's see, I had a lot of friends there, and uh, I also noticed that everyone was very friendly. Um, people had what, if they had, they saw someone that didn't have what they needed, a lot of people would share if they had more than they, than they needed. Um, there were also a lot of uh, poor people, a lot of street kids in that, in that town. Um, there were like little gangs of kids, little groups of kids, homeless maybe, some were selling things, candy, cigarettes, food, asking for money. Um, some had no parents and uh, some were just trying to support their family. And uh, so there are several like theories of to why there's so many street kids in this town. A decade before, um, there was a short war, I had a short war with this neighbor and you know a lot of the, the fathers may have not made it. And um, there was an, also a civil war in the neighboring country and uh, so a lot of refugees, families, kids, things like that. On my base, where I was at, we were living well compared to the rest of the country. Um, we had good food, nice quarters, clean water, indoor plumbing, all the, um, you know, so it was, it was nice. Um, I love the country and the people that I was, uh, in the country that I was at. And whenever I could, I would go out and make friends in the countryside, um, learn about the culture, take trips to the surrounding towns, um, and one thing I would do is load my backpack up with food and water, Gatorade, things like that. This cost me nothing um, because the chow hall we were at was overflowing with all these things, and it was all free. Um, so I figured, why not share? Um, when I was out in town or in the countryside, I would uh, see a group of street kids or someone you know, in need of something. And I would you know, give them some food, some water, some Gatorade, something like that. Um, so I got to know many of these kids that hung out on the beach asking for money. Um, I got to, you know, help out their family or whatever with things I had. Uh, so I had a great time getting to know the people, you know, in the country that I was at. Uh, but another thing about being that age in the military is that we would drink a lot. We'd party and, have, and drink. So, uh, so I'm not sure if it was because I was young and dumb or because it was part of the military culture um, or the crew I was at, but we'd drink a lot. And we weren't flying on a mission. We would be partying and drinking, having a good time on the beach. Um, <clears throat> but like I said, I've, I was, I've been in this country many times, and uh, I felt like I knew the place. I was very comfortable. I knew a lot of people. Um, it wasn't that big, so I knew a good portion of the people that I would see on the beach and things like that. Um, there were also, uh, since it was so poor, there was uh, parts of the city that were off limits to us. They said they were off limits, but uh, we took it as a suggestion. We didn't we felt like we knew the place, like it was our town, you know? So, uh, you know, we, we took it as just a suggestion. Um, so we knew, most of the people in my crew knew the language, we knew the people, and, but that's probably the reason that these rules existed for people like us that just kind of like, whatever, you know? Um, 
Well, one night I was at my favorite bar with my friends, and we were drinking for hours by this point, having a good time. So I wanted to change the scenery. I wanted to go to another bar I used to hang out, used to hang out at all the time. Um, so another suggestion that we had was that we don't walk by ourselves. We stay in Paris. We don't go through this neighborhood that was off limits. But I didn't feel like it applied to me. You know, I'd been there many times. I knew everybody. Um, so I started walking. It was like 10, 11 o'clock at night, pitch, pitch black, dark outside. Um, and I was walking through the shady neighborhood. And I was stumbling, obviously not completely sober. And after about 15 minutes or so, I was almost to my destination. I could see the lights and the noise of the, the little bar I was going to go to. Um, the street I was on was completely pitch black. There were no street lights where I was at. And it was quiet. So I was stumbling, and then I hear footsteps running up behind me. And I ignored them. The next thing I knew, I felt someone tugging my pants, someone slam into me. And I slammed me, not slam into me too hard, but someone, then I felt someone or something on my back. And I was kind of drunk, so I was like, what's going on? <laughs> so um, I felt these little hands pulling at me from all sides and pulling me down, and I was confused. Everything was a blur. And I immediately grabbed whatever was on my back, and I just threw it. And then I felt somebody slam on Slam, to, uh, slam onto me the other side, and I grabbed it and I threw again. And I was fighting on these, this, this blur of something and uh, was throwing them off, and they would jump on me again. And it was like multiple hands all over, and I was like, oh, it was crazy. So it took a minute for my eyes to focus and for me to realize that I was being attacked by a pack of street children. And there were little girls, like the oldest one may have been 12, some were like five or six, like tiny. And I was like, you know, I was buzzing, I was drunk, and it was dark, and this happened so quick, I, my brain didn't really realize what was going on. Um, so I would throw one, another one jump on top of me, this would keep going on, and they were reaching into my pockets, trying to grab every, anything I had, my wallet, my money, my backpack, everything was being taken from me. Um, and they were quick, I couldn't even fight them off. So um, the last girl I threw off, I recognized her. I saw her on the beach many times, and I I would give her, wa her and her friends water, food when they were hungry. Um, you know, they had nothing, so <clears throat> let's see. But I understood. When I saw her, I understood what was going on finally. And I know they have nothing. They're, they're poor. So, and I thought, you know, I was kind of scared because a lot of these times, a lot of these street kids, these gangs, were guided by adults. So there may have been adults hiding in the shadows, you know, directing this, this activity, this action. So... But I threw her off and I looked at her and I, I told her, you know, I know you, you know, I give you water, I give, I've given you food, you know, why are you doing this? Um, but I knew why, they were, they were desperate. I mean, I understood why, but that's what I told her, you know. Um, and when, she, when I said that, she recognized me. Her eyes got real big and she yelled at everyone to stop. And the other girls looked confused and asked her why, what was going on? Why was she telling them to stop? And she was almost crying and she was shaking and she told all the other girls to give back whatever they took from me. So, you know, they all were confused and they gave me all my stuff back. And uh, she looked sad, scared, and regretful. She apologized. And she, after she made sure I had everything that was taken from me, she ran off into the night. They all scattered. So I stumbled to the bar that I was trying to reach. I had a couple beers and I thought about what just happened. Probably not a good idea, but I was young, so. <laughs> I got me in trouble in the first place, but anyway. Okay, so several days later, I, I was on the beach again, and I ran into that little girl. Yeah, you know, when her gaze caught mine, she ran away, almost crying again, and she hid. So I went out and I found her. Uh, I gave her a bottle of water and an apple, some fruit, and I told her that it was okay, that I understood why she did what she did, and I was thankful to her for helping me out that night. You know, after, since then, I've thought a lot about that night, how... If I had not been nice and caring for other people, it might have ended up differently, um, the result. I didn't do what I did at first for any reward or get anything in return, any recognition or anything. But in the end of the day, it, that may have saved my life. So, that's it. That was amazing. Wow. Um, if, how many minutes do I have? Shrug, so I have an hour and a captive audience. <laughs> um, if the youth group wants to follow Candy out 
to the foyer, and youth group can be teens, uh, anyone who feels that they are too old for the little kid daycare. Do we have any parents in here that will like have a heart attack by sit like this? Okay. I'm like, I want to sit, but like, I want to be seen too, because we've got chairs in the back, so I'll just do something my mom would hate. So conflict. Um, the last time we had a conflict theme, I was up here shaking like a leaf because I was in the middle of the conflict, um, it, which went really well, actually, update. Um, I have some family members who prefer the term white nationalist to racists, um, <laughs> and that I was in the middle of lovingly and consistently going into this conflict with, being that one voice on their thread on Facebook. Oh, I hate conflict. There are people that are, you know, avoid conflict like the plague, you know? I'm one of the, anybody else like avoid conflict like the plague? And we even frame it like, we just aren't into drama, like it's superior somehow. Um, <laughs> we're cowards really though. Um, yeah, so that's me and I see that solidarity. <laughs> we can't, 100% avoid conflict, obviously. Uh, we try our darndest. But there are some conflict that I'm better about now um, because I practiced. So I wanted to give these good stories about how I overcame these situations that involved me having to stand up and say the right thing or do the right thing. And those feel really good. And I'm going to rattle them off because that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about when I flunked. So um, I, my life, Living authentically is conflict with my family, and uh, I know some of us are religious refugees. We can't go back, uh, and we lost community, and we lost friends, and we lost babysitters um, that I mourn. <laughs> we can't go back, and we find ourselves free-floating, and sometimes we find this community, which is radically inclusive, which I, I see spiritual people and I see religious people and I see atheists and I see secular people and, and everything in between. And uh, it's, it's a great community. Um, and I'm off topic because I talk about Sunday Assembly all the time, but um, marching in the Me Too march, the sign I held, uh, the shoes I'm wearing, the my opinions <laughs> um, all bring me into conflict, and I feel like I handle those really well. Um, family stuff, I handle that really well. Um, the, the, there was, I think I can use a first name. It's common enough, Kevin. How I handled Kevin, I'm really proud of. Kevin unintentionally ruined my life when I was 19 and he was 17, and I, I have binary thinking, that is my flaw. Binary thinking, he's evil, I'm good, he's wrong, I'm right, uh, which I now call ego, that is ego. And, and we had been separated by adults, by a justice system, but when we met on the courthouse steps and talked to each other, and he it humanized him, oh, you're a person, a person that made a mistake, and I held him as he cried. Um, he killed my mom. And I, didn't, I don't have to forgive him. That's not necessary. Um, some people, that helps them. I'm more like the Japanese samurai thinking of, that is unforgivable. Um, I got that from anime. That might not be accurate. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but I sometimes think about what he's doing now, and I wish him the best, and I wonder if he has kids, and what their shoe sizes are, and if I ever found out, and they got like anonymous Christmas presents with their favorite shoes from me, and like, so I can love people still, even if there's this one thing that I didn't like. Um, that's a good thing. So I'm gonna talk about two lessons I learned from doing conflict the wrong way the bad way, um, not the fun way. Like my husband and I have very little conflict. We like, that worked out really well considering we've been together 19 years um, because we got married as newborn babies and, <laughs> 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 
And, uh, and like the worst conflict I remember, just this minor thing, he was using too many paper towels. Like, use a plate, do the environment. And I always get on him, like, you don't need a paper towel for that. And there's one time where he just, I told you this already, but it's so funny. He just, dead stare, kept eye contact with me, grabbed the paper towel he was using, and ate it. <laughs> Okay, so our conflict is, is pretty easy. Here are two, two things I did conflict wrong that I hold with me and inspires me to do it right now. One is when I was a child. Um, we lived on a hill. I grew up in a cave. I'm not even lying. I grew up in a cave, um, <laughs> which was built into the hill. You could kind of see the roof. You know, the roof had dirt. You could kind of see the front that was made of rock. Um, my uncle and dad built it on my grandparents' property on Sky Court, which was like this hill that just went up into the sky, and my daughter's middle name is Sky for that reason. But at the bottom of the hill, there was a big dead-end sign and a cul-de-sac, and then a little house hidden up in the trees. And this cul-de-sac was a make-out spot for teenagers, but I did not know this. I just saw a bunch of broken bottles and clothing left there when I was a young girl. Does anyone remember Total Tangent, PBS, uh, KPBS, Ghostwriter, like the little kid. Yes, okay. So I had my notebook and I'm going to solve the mystery, right? And what does this scene look like to little kid me? A murder scene. There are bottles, there are clothing, somebody died. And so I had my Ghostwriter notebook and I'm solving the clues. And what's the only house around? This one house hidden in the trees, like right by there. And so, and I didn't know who lived in that house. I knew my whole family lived on this hill. But around the corner, I didn't know who lived there. But I was so determined, and I was being egged on by a friend, so determined to solve this mystery, so convinced the murderer must live in this house. Um, and so I decided, in all my kid wisdom, to break into this guy's house <laughs> and look for clues, which they did on Ghost Rider, in my defense, I think. And so, like, he was gone, the door was unlocked, I walked in, I saw incense, um, so clue number one, weird religious ceremony, you know, like, everything was blown up. He comes home while I'm in his house, and he pulls up the driveway, and I just, this is when kid me starts to put the pieces together. I'm breaking and entering, this is illegal, my parents are going to kill me, like, I'm going to jail forever. And I bolt out the door and run into the woods. Well, he sees me, and he reports it to another neighbor who I visit all the time, and a neighbor who lost all his fingers in the war, like, really cool neighbor. And the next day, the cool neighbor, Johnny, comes out, and he says, there was a break-in at my friend's house, and he's really upset. It wasn't you girls, was it? Because we were the only like kind of kids that lived on the hill. No, no, it wasn't me. I could not face up to what I'd done. I couldn't tell the truth. I couldn't have that conflict. I wanted everyone to like me and think well of me. Well, it turns out that this man was gay and that was he thought and went to his death thinking it was just another hate crime. Someone had broken into his house and because I did not step into that place of conflict and say it was me and let go of my ego and confirm a dumb kid was looking for clues from a TV show, he went to his grave thinking just another hate crime, another horrible thing that happened in his life. The second conflict that I regret, that informs how I handle it today, is an adult conflict, and it's similar. I was at California Free Thought Day, getting the worst headache of my life, and the speaker's voices were just going through my head. And so I ran to, the, to every corner looking for a first aid kit with a Tylenol. I just needed a Tylenol. Um, somebody had an Advil and I was really conflicted because I'm supposed to take Tylenol because I only have one kidney because I'm a kidney donor. Not that it would have mattered much, but I just was looking for a Tylenol and I ended up in the writer's room where all these book authors were 
someone had to Tylenol, and then I just sat there, like, letting the headache drain out of me and, and getting to know these writers. One of them was a trans woman who had written a series um, under a different name and was finally, like, presenting it as herself, and, and so that was exciting, and she was there, and she had just spoken to us all about that, um, and the photographer for the event, who's a really nice guy, walks in the room, and the first thing he does is go, this guy is great. This guy is great. Um, he, 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 he. And this silence like, was felt like it was palpable in the room. And she, the author, she kind of slinks. She kind of gets closer to uh, the girl she was with and kind of gets quiet and kind of gets smaller. That, that I now recognize is like, is this a safe place? Um, and I, I knew, I just had to say, I just had to, and this felt like conflict, conflict. I just put myself in the middle of the situation and just go, dude, you mean her? Like, she did this? What are you talking about? Yeah, it would have been so easy. And as the seconds went by, that little interjection would be more and more awkward. And it just, it just like, we just sat with that silence. And I watched it affect her and, like, hurt her. And I always regretted that. And I always thought, I'm never going to do that again. I'm always going to stand up and say, you mean her, you mean she, make that safe space. Because the two lessons I learned were, one, people know this stuff. They just don't always know how to apply it. He knew about trans issues, the photographer. He just didn't know how to do it then. And the other conclusion I had was, um, people who are better at this conflict thing maybe are just better because they had more practice. <laughs> and now if we could just take a moment of silent reflection. All right, thank you so much. Um, one more thing I forgot to mention in my binary thinking. Our youth group is looking for another lead and it can be any gender, we just didn't want it all to be one focus. Where say they, I think they're looking for a female, hi baby, <coughs> a female lead to, to provide that like replacement. It can be any gender, we're just looking for a variety there, so if I misspoke before. And also, um, if, if you are giving an announcement, if you can make your way up, I'm not sure who all is. So uh, Sunday Assembly is going to have a booth at Earth Day. Uh, we're not exactly sure where yet, but we'll have more detail when it gets closer. So that event is happening on Sunday, April 22nd in Balboa Park. Um, if you'd like to volunteer, we welcome you to join us. Or if you're at Earth Day, just swing by and say hi. Um, you can find more information on Facebook and Meetup. Howdy, y'all. We're going to shake things up a little. This year, save your date for July 14th and July 15th. We'll be participating in the Pride Parade and hosting a booth at the festival. 
So uh, join us. We're going to need lots of sparkles, lots of unicorns. You know, even if you're not, I won't judge. Come with us. You know, we know how to party, just saying. <laughs> but uh, we do need volunteers to help us ban the booth and the, uh, you know, actual parade vehicle. So if you want to help out with pride and have an impact, talk to me and we'll get you in the group. We will be doing the festival both days. Hmm? We're talking about the Pride Parade. And, um, a couple of our assemblers uh, told, let us know that uh, as a nonprofit, we're able to take donations from people that sell and buy on eBay. And we just finished the registration process. And we're going to have a, um, an eBay listing party where we'll show people how to list their items if they're interested in, uh, in doing that. And we'll show them how you can donate to your charity of choice. Of course, we would be uh, greatly, uh, we would greatly appreciate it if you choose Sunday Assembly as your charity of choice, but you don't have to. Uh, so hopefully you can join us. It's gonna be Saturday. Um, the 7th of April in Point Loma. Thanks. And one last announcement. We are Sunday Assembly San Diego and we are 100% run by volunteers and we rely desperately on your recurring monthly donations. You can set that up in the back on, uh, on a computer so it's like magic money. It's not like real money out of your pocket. It's like magic money. Uh, it just disappears out of a magic computer. That's how that works, right? Yep, absolutely. Okay, great. Okay, I just want to go on record as saying that the ego has gotten the short end of this conversation today. And so because I am always the one pulling for the underdog. Stand up now, let's stretch our legs and join me in the other side of the conversation. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble. When you're perfect in every way I can't wait to look in the mirror Cause I'm getting better looking each day To know me is to love me I must be a hell of a man Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble But we're doing the best that we can I used to have a girlfriend, but I guess she couldn't compete with all these love-starved women who keep clamoring at my feet. Oh, I probably could find me another, but I guess there She could say I'm a loner 